I was born and raised in Burundi, a small country in, in east central of Africa. My country is known by a civil war that has been going on for years and years. And so many people have died. So many people have left the country and became refugees in some other countries. So many women have been raped, and so many kids have become orphans. In 2005, the United Nations, they deployed a UN peacekeeping mission to come and help us to find peace. Because there was a group of rebels during that time that was attacking the government, and they wanted to take over. So the United Nations, they came to my country to help us to find peace and to protect the local community. In my country, we have two main ethnic groups, Hutu and Tutsi. And those rebels, they were coming from the Hutu tribe. Those UN peacekeepers, they were coming from uh, English-speaking countries. And my country uses French as an official language. So they needed somebody to help them communicate with the local community. I speak five languages, and I applied to be a translator. That's how I landed a job to work in the UN. Working in the UN was a big deal for me and for everybody in my country because you are well paid, you drive a nice car. It was amazing. When I was working in the UN, I was staying in the UN base with the UN peacekeepers. Life was great. It felt like living in another country, in your own country, because the food was good. Every time I was speaking English, it was amazing. I worked in the UN for nine months. And then I went on leave to be with my family for vacation. Like I said, I'm a runner. And one day, I was coming from a running walkout. It was in the evening. When I reached my family's house gate, I saw a group of people who were standing by our house. And I thought that they were just people from the neighborhood who were just hanging out. As I reached them, they jumped on me, and they grabbed me, and they started telling me that I was their enemy. I asked them why, and they told me that for me working in the UN, I was helping the UN peacekeepers to destroy them, and they were not happy with that. That day, I was kidnapped, and I was taken to the jungle where those rebels were staying. My life went in the darkness. Being in that place was horrible. I was tortured. Imagine being beaten every morning without clothes on your body. Imagine cutting your foot tendon so that you cannot be able to run away. Imagine staying in a small room without windows where you cannot see the sunlight and easing yourself in a small pot that they put there. The room was stinking so bad. And they were telling me that what was next was to kill me. I stayed in that place for seven days until one day the UN peacekeepers and the soldiers of my country came and they invaded the place. I, I can remember it was early in the morning, I heard a big noise over the place like a thunder and everyone was running away. The whole place was covered by a smoke and I managed to drag myself from that place. I was found by the UN peacekeepers laying on the road which was nearby. And they were able to recognize me. 
During that time, they asked me if they could take me back home, and they said no, because I felt like going back home, I was not going to be safe, and at the same time, I was going to put my family in danger. I told them that I have an uncle who was living in the north of the country. They took me there, but like I said, my country is very small. After a few days, we heard some neighbors who came to tell us that strangers you know, were coming around my uncle's house and asking if I was hiding there. Those were some of those rebels who were tracking me down because they didn't want me to reveal the secrets of what they were planning to do when I was in that place. My family sat down and the only solution they came up with was to leave the country and go somewhere else and ask the asylum. Ladies and gentlemen, leaving your own country is not easy. It is heartbreaking leaving your family, the culture, the food, the friends, things you know, and decide to go in a country where nobody knows you, and even in a place where you don't speak their language. It was hard. I ended up going to Ethiopia where I lived as a refugee for six years in the refugee camp. Life in the refugee camp was very hard, tough. First of all, we didn't have enough food to eat because the aid that the UNHCR, which is the UN agency helping refugees around the world was not enough. All those six years, I was starving. I still remember every evening, small kids crying because their parents didn't have food for dinner before they go to sleep. It was a hard time for parents who had kids. Second, many countries, they don't provide work permit for refugees, so I spent all those six years without a job. It was boring to live in that kind of situation. As a young person, I could not see my future. In the refugee camps, you find people who are doctors, teachers, businessmen, successful people who are there doing nothing. I lived that kind of life for six years until one day a friend of mine who was from Congo, he was a refugee also, and right now he's in Boise, he came to me and he told me that he saw my name on the list of the people that U.S. was going to take. I looked in his face and I said, hey, you joke a lot, but that is not something to joke about because what he was trying to tell me was so good to be true. And he said, yes, I saw your name on the list of the people that U.S. is going to take. Go and check it out tomorrow, because when he told me that, it was in the evening. The next morning, I ran to the UNHCR office, which was two miles away from the refugee camp. As a runner, I ran so fast, maybe I broke the world record on that distance. <laughs> when I reached there, I saw the list of those people that U.S. has chosen to come over here. But again, I read my names 10 times to make sure that the spelling was right. And yes, it was my name. I jumped and I said, yes, I'm going to U.S., the great country on planet Earth, the country I used to see in the movies. I could not believe it. After that, I was scheduled for interviews. I went through six of them, some of them with the FBI, USCIS. I went through medical checkups because they have to make sure that you don't have diseases which are not allowed to come in the country. The whole process for me took a year to travel here because when you are chosen to come, you don't travel the next day. There's a long process that you have to go through. And some refugees, they don't pass that process. 
I came here in the United States in 2012, August 29th. I will never forget that day. It was a memorable day for me. It was like being born again and become a small baby because I could see my life changing overnight within 24 hours. I remember being at the international airport of Ethiopia, getting ready to fly to US. When I pulled my first foot on the plane, I felt like one part of me was already in the US and the other part was still in Africa. And I felt a huge burden falling off over me. It was an amazing moment. But at the same time, Tears came on my face, remembering those thousands of people I was living in that place, without help, without food, without anything. All the way coming to US, I was crying, tears of joy, because I could not see how someone's life can change overnight. It was amazing. I first landed in LA, Los Angeles, and the airport was so huge, I was amazed, overwhelmed. I was like, I've never seen this before. It was cool. Then the same day, I flew to Spokane. And when I reached the Spokane airport, I was received by a case worker from World Relief. And when I showed up, he screamed. He said, welcome to Spokane, come. We are so glad you are here. I was so happy to see someone who I've never seen before calling my name. It was so cool. And then he hugged me, and then we drove to my, to my apartment. That was prepared for me. The next day, I went to the World Relief Office for paperwork. And when I was in the lobby, the director came to me, and he said, Come, welcome to Spokane. He shook my hand and he said, we've been praying for you and you'll be successful in this nation. To tell you the truth, those wonderful words changed my life. Why? Because during the, all those six years, nobody came and told me that I was going to be successful. What I knew, I was useless, a refugee, a kind of no future person. It is funny how things that we go through can give us a new identity. From that day, my mind changed. I told myself, I am successful. I took those words as a foundation of my life here in the US. Within a month, I was hired as an overnight stoker at Walmart, working a graveyard from 10 p.m. through 7 a.m. It was hard. I've never worked a night before. My body was tired all the time, telling me, no, you cannot do it. You've never done that before. Go sleep. <laughs> but I decided to work very hard to be successful, and at the same time, to give back to this nation that has given me much. I worked there for a year. Working at Walmart was a huge experience. To be honest, back home we don't have Walmart stores. And working at Walmart, Walmart was like a notion, big, huge. I had to learn the names of food because I was working in the grocery department. And it is amazing to see how many kinds of food this country has. I even saw a section where they, you know, they sell food for animals, and I was like, that's good. I will never starve again. Even animals have enough to eat. <laughs> I had to learn names of those different items and know where they go, because sometimes you can pick you know, two different packets, but they look alike. But when you look carefully, one says sugar-free, and that means this goes here and this goes over here. It was amazing. 
After a few months, I was able to help customers when they come in and ask me where things are. And I was very proud you know, to tell them, yeah, I know where that thing is. That was really cool. After a year, I was hired by World Relief to be a case worker to help other refugees to find jobs here in the U.S. It's been a huge experience to help refugees coming for, from all over the world. I feel like my hands are touching the whole globe because I have helped so many refugees coming from different countries. Those refugees, when they come over here, they come here with a recipe of different ideas and different experiences. One thing I have learned through my life as a refugee is this one. Refugee camps are the richest places in the world. Why? Because there you find books that will never be written, songs that will never be sung, dreams and ideas that will never get an opportunity to become the reality. There you find the potential trapped in those people who have no chance to do something. Refugee camps are the richest places in the world, more than the gold mine in South Africa, or the diamond mine in, the, in, in Congo, or the oil in the, in the Middle East. Why? Because each and every one among us is created with a potential, something special to offer here on Earth. And nobody here is an accident, including those refugees. What if we stretch our hands and open our doors and receive those refugees and give them a chance to release their potential? Because I believe the world is waiting patiently for the manifestation of that potential trapped in those refugees. I believe some of the problems that the world faces right now, the solution is found in those refugees who don't have the opportunity to do something to pursue their purpose they were created for. I believe trapped in the refugee camp is the second Steve Jobs I believe trapped in the refugee camp is the second big gate. I believe trapped in the refugee camp is the second Albert Einstein. By the way, he was a refugee. What if we create some businesses in those refugee camps, build schools, and transform those refugee camps into cities where other people envy to go and live? What if we saw the refugee crisis going on right now as an opportunity, not as a problem? I thank this country for giving me this chance to come and live over here. My life has changed. What if we gave that same opportunity to other people? I know some of us were afraid of refugees. Recently, I read a comment of somebody who, that he made on the refugee crisis. He said, a refugee is not dangerous. And he went on and he said, the dangerous person is the one who made that person a refugee. So, I am a refugee, but I'm not a dangerous person. The one who is dangerous is the one who made me a refugee. I'm a victim of what those bad guys did for me. Right now, I ask and I challenge everyone to think about it. Because in the future, our kids and our grandkids 
we ask us what we did in the face of this refugee crisis going on right now. What, what is going to be our answer? I'm so thankful. And may U.S. continue to be that great beacon for hope for the hopeless and home for the homeless and the rest for the weary. As God is our hope and strength, so are we empowered to give the same to those who seek it. Thank you.